the, the cards are in actually Hamas's hands, right? They, they need to make a decision what they're going to do. Because Israel will do what it needs to do to basically rid Gaza of Hamas and the threat that Hamas poses to the state of Israel. That said, as I said earlier, Israel needs to do as much as humanly possible to prevent the loss of innocent lives. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. It is my great pleasure to have my friend and former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Tom Nides, joining me today. Um, first of all, time, thank you for taking the time. My pleasure, Willie. Let me do a quick intro and then we'll dive into, obviously, everything that's going on today. Um, Tom Nides uh, is an American banker and government official who served as the United States Ambassador to Israel from December 2021 to July of 2023. From 2013 to 2021, he was the managing director and vice chairman at Morgan Stanley, serving as a member of the firm's management and operating committees. Nides is previously deputy secretary of state for management and resources from 2011 to 2013 during the Obama administration. He has served in various financial and government roles throughout his life. He has a BA from the University of Minnesota. He is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. He is the father of Max and Taylor and husband of the wonderful Virginia. And it's my honor and pleasure to have you here today. Um, so Tom, do you wish you were still U.S. Ambassador to Israel? <laughs> you know, I think about this all the time because I, you know, obviously I'm in constant contact with my friends there, uh, my friends, my colleagues. You know, there's a little bit of my, you know, sort of a little bit of a, I like to know, like a little bit of PTSD, a little bit like, you know, I was there and should I be there? Um, the reality of this is, is that Jack Lou, who is, has just taken my role, is, is ironically, I took his job as Deputy Secretary of State, so we've kind of switched jobs between. He also became Chief of Staff and Treasury Secretary, so uh, he's done a pretty good job. So now we know what we're going to. We know what you're going to do next. Yeah, right? your mouth and God's here. So, but the reality of this is he, he's well placed. This is it. This is what has happened in Israel is the most probably the most significant event since 1948 to the to the birth of the state. And, and obviously we'll spend a little time talking about this, but what Israel is going through right now, it would be the equivalent of 350 million Americans, God forbid, have lost a family member in 9-11. That, that's, that's what Israel is going through. Every single Israeli, 9 million Israelis live in Israel, obviously. They're all affected by this, not just, I mean, Either they know someone that was kidnapped uh, on October 7th. Um, their family members have now been called up to reserves because a huge amount of any one who's under 40 had been called up to serve. Uh, they were killed. Um, they're kidnapped. I'm literally leaving here today to go sit with a bunch of the family members of, of those who were held hostage in Gaza. So the whole country is real. The country will never be the same. Never be the same after what they have just gone through. And so... To be honest, you know, not being there obviously is I think difficult. Actually, going there next week to spend some time as an, as I was yeah, not as an official capacity. So I do feel this compulsion to be there to be with my friends to see what they're going through and feeling the pain that they're all feeling. So before we dive into October seventh and what's happened in the aftermath of October seventh, you were there in a relatively speaking, peaceful time. Talk for a moment as it relates to what you were doing as U.S. ambassador leading up to this, because everything has changed so dramatically, but it's interesting of when you were there as ambassador, what were the issue, the big issues at that time? Because right now everything has been sort of pushed to the sidelines on October 7th. You know, listen, I mean, first of all, people need to understand, you know, I think you knew this in July, America is Israel's most important ally. Okay, there's nothing, there's no, there's no, there's no question in Israel, counts on the United States, not only for its support, both um, for the systems that they have, such as the Iron Dome, but the kind of the moral support they get from the, they like refer to it as a diaspora community, the, the Jewish community that lives uh, in the United States. 
So this relationship, as Joe Biden likes to say, is kind of an unbreakable bond between our two countries. So that has all its, all the benefits and then plenty of challenges along the way. Right. The threat around Hamas, you know, that was going on when I was there. There was multiple periods of time where Hamas was shooting off rockets into Israel and Israel would respond and this would go back for a few days and then the world end. The issues around Hezbollah in Lebanon was certainly always a real issue. Obviously, the threat of Iran was there. I also was involved heavily in this whole judicial reform that Israel was going through. I also had three prime ministers. You know, I had I got there and uh, Naftali Bennett had just gotten elected. He then switched jobs uh, with uh, Prime Minister Lapid. And then ultimately, uh, Netanyahu won the election against Lapid. So three prime ministers in less than two years, which means, I mean, it was a little bit chaotic for all of us. But again, the basic issue is the relation between these two countries is like this. It's like uh, uh, family members. And we, we say Meshbuka in, uh, uh, in Yiddish. And, and the reality is this is like a family. You know, it's a gets to be a kind of a food fight family, as we all know, coming up to Thanksgiving. And we know what all happens at Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving uh, tables. Um, uh, but but this is this is the relationship is strong. The, the, the issues that the United States and Israel have are really around security. Uh, democratic values, the question around a two-state solution. So there's plenty of issues. So it's, it's not a boring place. And quite frankly, I would bet you, I just got, I just left, literally left the Capitol like an hour ago. I spoke to all the Democratic senators. And, you know, I would bet you there's, there's 535 members of Congress. I bet you 300 of them came to visit me in two years. I mean, it's nuts. I mean, every single Jewish, non-Jewish Black, white, Republican, Democrat, they all come. Everyone believes they want to be part of what goes on in Israel. It's a magical place, complicated as it may be, even more complicated post-October 7th, but it's a very cool place, very important for us. And again, I go back to this. This is this is a democratic country in a in a region there isn't many of us, like none, and it's an important ally. The Trump administration moved the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem beyond the fact that it was difficult to find you somewhere to live when you first got over there. Talk about that move and the significance to the Israeli people of the U.S. moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Listen, I, you know, uh, would it have happened under a Democratic administration? Probably not, uh, because it, it wasn't just the, the, the decision of moving the embassy. Remember, we always declare that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, right? That was not, there was no, both Democrat and Republican administrations have always agreed to that. And both Democrat and Republican administrations before Trump left the left the embassy in Tel Aviv. Okay, so George Bush 41, 43, you know, Ronald Reagan. I mean, this is not something new, guys. And the Trump administration moved it. Now, the reason we never moved it and the Republican administrations before us, we were worried about the implications of it. Because ultimately, if you believe in a two-state solution, the what's going to happen in Jerusalem was supposed to be the last issue on the table. And what message you send to the Arab world if you move your embassy, the U.S. embassy, to Jerusalem? Now, no, no, virtually very few countries, not like none, had actually moved it there. And by us doing it, we were worried that we we would ignite the Middle East. Um, we were wrong. The Trump administration did it. There really wasn't much blowback from the Middle East countries. Um, it's the capital of Israel, and you know, I, you know, I've never ever suggested it was going to be moved back. It wasn't going to be moved back. That is the capital. Uh, they did what they needed to do in their view, and you know we obviously supported it. I mean, we supported that post after it was done. Uh, and you're right. Um, part of that move, sadly, also meant that my house, or, or the house of the ambassador, which was in Herzliya, a beautiful house. I'm just not to be done. I may start crying now. Um, <laughs> but they sold the house to to Miriam Adelson and Sheldon Adelson uh, for like eighty five million dollars, a lot of money. Uh, it seems to be a lot of real estate people on there on this phone call. That was in dollars, by the way. Um, and uh, and I, if I, if I, ironically, um, I became quite friendly with Miriam. Um, she invited. You were me trying to, to get her house back. Yeah, I know. It was she said. <laughs> I, I was invited to her house, uh, to the house, our old house, the American Embassy house. Uh, and uh, I was invited by David Friedman, my predecessor. Although David and I agree about nothing politically, I actually like him as a human being. He says <laughs> Miriam wants you to. The color of the house for Shabbat dinner. So I we I go to her to Leah, I walk in and Miriam's standing in the living room and, and she looks at me and goes, 
this could have been your living room. Yeah. Okay. And she and I became friends and I really have a lot of respect for her. Again, our politics are a little different, like very different, but she's a very nice person who cares deeply about the state of Israel. In fact, I went with her and David Friedman to Poland to the thing called the March of Living. And the two of us, Dave, David Friedman asked me if I would co-chair with him. And I said, sure, why not? He goes, don't you have to ask the White House? I'm like, no, it's to fight anti-Semitism. It's kids, like 25 to 30,000 kids walk from Auschwitz to Birkenau. And for any of you on this call, that's about a two mile walk. It's the same walk as the train tracks took people at the labor camp at Auschwitz and then basically killed them at Birkenau. We walked and there I am holding hands with Miriam Adelson and Bob Kraft and and, uh, and David Friedman. And I'm like, as we walked and behind us was 20,000 kids and all with a theme, never forget. Anyway, so the point is, they sold my house. It's okay. I got over it. I live in a hotel. Don't feel sorry for me. Uh, in Jerusalem, we finally got a, a house um, in Jerusalem later. But listen, the the uh, the moving of the capital, the, it's the capital is is uh, uh, of, of Israel is Jerusalem. That will never change. Uh, and this was one of the different policy uh, issues that the, the Trump administration did. And I will tell you though, even though I wasn't necessarily supportive of that at the time, it was fine. Uh, but what they do need to get credit for is the Abraham Accords. Right. And, and I think that's an important part of what they did. So why don't we dive into that for a second? Um, so Abraham Accords were negotiated by the Trump administration. One of the things in looking back on those versus the deal that the Biden administration was trying to put together between Israel and Saudi Arabia um, was the Abraham Accords between Bahrain, UAE, Morocco, and Sudan and Israel were done in secrecy before they were announced versus there was quite public view of what was going on with Saudi Arabia. If the agreement with Saudi Arabia had been done in the same way that the Abraham Accords had been done, do we have what happened on October 7th? I mean, in other words, there was October 7th a move to try and arrest that negotiation? No, none of them have severed a relationship with Israel. Um, they have been, you know, relatively, not, I wouldn't say muted, on the criticism of Israel, but, you know, critical, uh, but have not suggested they're going to change their relationship with Israel for the time being, which is a, which is which says a lot about the strength of the Abraham Accords, the importance for the region. So that's good. Um, there's been all sorts of rumors about, you know, did Hamas do this with Iran's blessing so they could screw up the Saudi thing? That's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, the... the that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous, yeah. There's a few reasons. Number one, the planning of this has been going on for a year, maybe even longer, right? The, the real conversations with the Saudis only really started to coming together the last few months. So the reality of this is that's not, it wasn't a factor in the decision because at the end of the day, Hamas's decision to attack Israel is for one decision only, which is to destroy the state of Israel. OK, they they are not into a two state solution. Do they care about this or care about that? What they care about is destruction of the state of Israel. And the way to get Israel destroyed, in their view, was to create a war, because ultimately they knew what they were doing would trigger off a response by Israel, as you see play out, right. which their hope would be that the whole world would come against Israel and they would then drag Iran and Hezbollah into this. So I, I don't you know. Is it a good conversation to say, you know, this was created because the United States was talking with the Saudis? Yeah. I think, I think personally, I think it's nonsense. I mean, sure, does the are the Iranians like the idea of more chaos? Sure, but again, I just I think it is one step too far because given the timing of it, the intelligence that we had, and the reality of this is is that the. The side deal was always going to be a different deal than the other deals of the other countries. First of all, Saudi is a much bigger deal. I mean, it, obviously, Emirates are important to Bahrain and Morocco, but the Saudi's relationship with Israel has been fraught for a long period of time. So it's, it was important to put this in context. So I don't, I don't believe it was the, the major reason why the the uh, Hamas did it. Um, maybe around the edges would that be interesting? But I think ultimately, it was really the. Hamas did what they did, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more for this for the sole purpose of destroying the state of Israel. That's that is the, that is their game. That and they, by the way, they don't give a crap of how many Palestinians will die right. in the meantime because they're martyrs. 
in the mar- this bit, it's all about martyrism, which is more Palestinians die, they're dying for the cause. Now, you might want to ask some of these poor Palestinians, these Gazans, right. if they think it's worth the cause for them to be dying is a whole other question. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. So on Iran, the Trump administration had some pretty significant sanctions against Iran as it relates to oil sales. And so my understanding was that pre-sanctions, Iran was selling about 2 million barrels a day on the global market. Under the sanctions of the Trump administration, that went down to 100,000 barrels a day. That stripped somewhere between 30 and $40 billion of, if you will, hard money coming into Iran to both fund everything they wanted to do, as well as fund their payments to Hamas to foment terror in the Middle East. The Biden administration pulled back on those sanctions, which then brought additional revenues into Iran. How, as you think about that, Tom, because at the same time as pulling back on the sanctions, the Biden administration also gave significant aid to the Palestinian people and brought up the humanitarian aid that was going to Palestine at that time. As you think about the sanctions against Iran and the, if you will, tough stance versus a more appeasing, let's work with you stance, given everything that's happened, how do we move forward as it relates to relationships with Iran and the sanctions against Iran that were in place that had been pulled back? Okay, I fundamentally disagree with what you, what you said. Okay. okay. First of all, there, the, the, the evidence, the facts are that the vast majority of the sanctions that were put in on the Trump administration were not only left in place by the Biden administration, but were then strengthened to get most, most of Europe to buy into it, okay? So ultimately, the idea under the the Trump administration, the Trump administration's goal was, is to break Iran, right. okay? Is to get them crawling back to the table and saying, no mas. So again, this is not, a, I'm not, I'm not, it's not political. I'm just giving you what facts are. The facts are, following the Trump administration's sanction regime, what happened, okay? Basically, the economy in Iran did not collapse, quite the opposite, right? Number two, they got closer and closer to building the bomb which is ultimately what they were trying to prevent. In fact, arguably, they moved from a percentage of uh, enriching uranium almost to breakout, which is around 90% uranium breakout, which will be able to create the ability for them to create a nuclear weapon, which is what Joe Biden said he'll never stand for doing. The reality is we didn't, contrary to what all the detractors were suggesting, that the Biden decision was going to go back into the JCPOA. That never happened because the president himself basically put on the table many more hurdles that the Iranians would have to do for us to even get back to the table, which the Iranians were refusing to do. So ultimately, as I like to say to people, tell me right now today that the actions that were taken in the previous administration against not political, did it did it help us or hurt us? Did we get closer to basically having uh, Iran without a nuclear weapon or closer to a nuclear weapon? And my argument would be, and I've had this argument with many of my Republican friends, who were opposing the JCPOA, didn't like the JCPOA, ripped up the JCPOA. And I'm like, like Ronald Reagan just said, are we better off today than we were before? Answer that question and I'll give you the facts. So on the sanctioned regimes, I I just, so just to be on a factual basis, um, the, the, the vast majority of sanctions that were put in place were not only left in place, but strengthened against the Iranians. Now, to be clear, Iran is still at that place where they could one day decide they're going to break up. They're going to have a nuclear weapon. Joe Biden has said very clearly, we're not going to let you have a nuclear weapon. You can now make, you can now come to whatever creative thoughts you have and what we will do if that happens. Arguably, you might want to ask the Iranians when they look at those big, huge ships that, that Biden put in the Mediterranean about and basically telling Hezbollah and the Iranians, don't screw with Israel. Okay. There's a reason why Hezbollah has not gotten into this right now. You know, Biden likes to say superpowers don't bluff. Listen, one of the benefits of Biden being so old, he knows this stuff. He knows it really well. He understands it. He's been at the table. And I wouldn't screw with him on this. So I think ultimately um, the Iran issue itself, just do we want to go to war with Iran? Not really. Do the American people want to go to war with Iran? Not really, to be honest with you. I think that most people listening to this call, if you said, would you like to go to have a, a significant war? And by the way, a war with Iran is much more significant than watching what's going on with Hamas, okay? Sure. Their abilities to have an enormous toll 
we'll, we were willing to do what we need to do to stop Iran and have a nuclear weapon. But there's no question that Biden would like, they talk about the three Ds, you know, degradation and deterrence. You know, we talk about the third D, which is diplomacy. Is there a di diplomatic piece of this? And we'll see how this all plays out. But again, as someone who's spent a lot of time on this Iran issue, I was involved early on in the JCPOA under Secretary Clinton. It wasn't a perfect deal without question. But let me tell you something. I'm a big believer in like facts first. I'm a big believer in what's going to get us to what we need to do. And ultimately, I think most people listening to this call would like to figure out this out without putting our troops at harm's way and getting into a war uh, with uh, with Iran. So, so let's see how it plays out. Let's jump to Hamas 2005, Israel um steps out of gaza um is then accused of having gaza be an apartheid state and so says okay great you have your own elections the palestinian authority allowed hamas to if you will run at that time how did how did hamas win that election in the sense that was there actually a true election because hamas has been in power my understanding for the last 16 years yeah um how did how did the palestinian authority allow hamas into that and then I guess the other thing is, as we look forward, where the clear intention is that Hamas will not exist going forward, what exists of the Palestinian Authority after Hamas has been in power for 16 years? Um, so let's step back. So as you know, um, the disengagement in Gaza was was done for the sole purpose that Israel did not want to manage Gaza. Okay, they didn't they didn't want to put the the money, the troop presence. They fundamentally believed disengaging in in Gaza was important, and also for the for the sake of the Gazans, the two million Gazans who lived there and felt that they should be, uh, if there was going to be a government, whatever that would look like, uh, it should be uh, not a non-Israelis, okay? You can debate, was that a good decision or a bad decision, but that was the decision at the time. Um, the policy authority was there, obviously um, got voted out by uh, Hamas. You know, we've seen this in plenty of other countries. You saw this in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. They came in, they got elected. And Hamas um, is an outcropping of the Muslim without Brotherhood. Without question. Right? And, and to be clear, for those of you the people who are listening to this, to understand it, Hamas is like ISIS. They're, they're, a, they're a terrorist organization, designated as a terrorist organization by the United States and most of the world. Um, uh, they operated uh, Gaza uh, with an iron fist. I mean, it was not dissimilar to some of the worst instincts of Castro, you know, in the 1940s, even worse so. Because it was a it was a military operation, a jihadist operation, which prevented um, uh, women basically from working, um, gay rights, women's rights. You know, they taught the schools. It was a it was a fundamentalist driven, not dissimilar to ISIS in some places. Um, ultimately, um, there was never an election in Gaza. To your point, because they were afraid what the outcome. It, ironically, the people who are actually relatively popular in Gaza is the Palestinian Authority, which is completely ironic because, you know, they're, they're the ones who were pushed out, you know, 16 years ago. Now, one of the reasons is that the Palestinian Authority still pays for many of the salaries in Gaza, ironically. And you know who's really popular in the West Bank? Hamas. It's, it's, it's basically like you want what you can't have. And that's why in the West Bank, in, 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 under uh, uh, President Abbas, why President Abbas is not allowed elections to happen because he could wake up and realize Hamas has taken over the BA. So it's it is it's the Middle East, guys, just to be clear, it's the Middle East. But ultimately, what people need to understand is Hamas does not speak for the Palestinian people. That's what's what was, and I said this at the Senate just a few minutes ago. Hamas is an ideology, okay? It's an ideology and it's it's a terrorist organization. When they wake up in the morning, they don't say, wow, wouldn't it be grand if more Palestinians had like better education? Or wow, wouldn't it be interesting if we have a two-state solution? They don't give a crap about any of that. Their whole, which is by the way, a miscalculation on Israel's part. This is what how I think ultimately when they when they really study how this happened, one of the miscalculations was is that they actually believe the Hamas wasn't reforming itself, but wanted all the goodies more than they, than they thought, meaning they wanted the work permits. 15,000 Gazans went to Israel every day. 15,000, right? They got money, which Israel allowed to happen from Qatar into Gaza to pay for things, right? Went through Egypt, right? And I think the miscalculation on Shin Bet was, 
you know, they like all this stuff too much, and there's no way they can do anything to basically screw that up. And that was the mistake. And I, in my view, right, we could get into a longer debate about how it all happened, but I think it's important to is, is this is complicated stuff, you don't really understand it, but but the reality of this is Hamas's whole sense of being, their whole focus is just like any um uh uh ISIS-like organization. It's an ideology, and their belief is martyrism will come when the destruction of the state of Israel occurs. Everything else be damned. I mean, the idea that they have all this food and medical equipment in the tunnels, right. and they won't share it with the with the Gazans, because they basically, that's the UN's job. Let the UN uh, take care of the people. We got to take care of ourselves. This is the logic that's going on, and this is what we're doing. Your comment about the money coming into both Hamas as well as the Palestinian Authority. I was listening to uh, a Jared Kushner on a podcast. And he was talking about when he was in the White House and um, uh, Netanyahu came over to visit him and took an El Al flight over from uh, Israel and landed in Washington and came to visit him at the White House. And uh, when Abbas came over, he flew over in a Boeing business jet. And when he was in the White House, had someone light a cigarette for him. And he was just basically saying the the difference in the way that they. Oh, but that's, all, that's all such nonsense. You know, we can all, you know, this is like the crap about the, you know, welfare ladies and limousines. Oh, come on. It's ridiculous. There's a, there's a way that Arab countries behave. We may like it or not like it. But the reality of this is, there's a way that Israelis behave that we may or may not like it. That's all kind of nonsense. That's all kabuki dance. That's all, that's all nonsensical. No. Is there corruption in the West Bank? Sure. Is a boss of play? without question? No, no question about it. Is some of the behaviors that Prime Minister Netanyahu allowed to happen uh, during his tenure, especially his last tenure, uh, created uh, difficult environments for the Palestinians? Without question. So, I mean, if we start. My my view of this is there's plenty of things to pick on, sure. right? And a boss is 86 years old, and he chain smokes and you know, he's got some corruption stuff, and I'm sure it's, you know, but if you went around and determined the corruption in the Middle East, or quite frankly, anywhere, you could have a longer debate. So, again, I, I'm, I, Jared, Jared is Jared, and I think it's interesting. It's a, it's a funny, um, uh, kind of, uh, and about, about, about yeah. what, what they do or don't do. But at the end of the day, uh, for good or for bad, we're going to rue the day, folks, when President Abbas is not in the West Bank, because at the end of the day, Although he's not very strong and certainly not particularly well liked in the West Bank, he still does plenty of cooperation with the Israelis. I mean, the Israeli security forces come in and come out of the West Bank all the time. And there's a lot of information sharing that goes on, which I can't really get into here. But the reality of this is, you know, um, you know, they need a transition, they need elections in uh in the West Bank. Yes, they probably need a little succession planning, given the fact he's 86 years old and he smokes. Three packs of cigarettes a day, so that needs to happen. But again, there's I'd like to be clear. There's there's a lot of reasons why we're here. So uh, October seventh, um, one of the things that another thing that I've heard is that there was a lot of thought that Iran was intimately involved in the planning of October seventh. And what I've heard from various government officials, not you, um, is that um, actually from our if you will, listening in on Iranian communication, it came as much of a surprise to them as it came to the entire world in the sense that the Iranians were not in the actual planning. They may have been in the funding of it leading up to it, but they were not, that it came to them as a surprise on the day of it. I, you could, I don't know, I'm not looking for you to respond to that. But on October 7th, uh, to your point at the beginning, you have to keep in mind the scale of this and you sized it as it relates to in the United States, what it would have been in relation to 9-11. And, and, and many people that I've spoken to about October 7th for Israel and for the Jewish community, this was their 9-11. Um, was there any ability, Tom, for Israel not to respond to this in the way that they have responded to it? So we clearly in the United States after 9-11 responded to 9-11 in a war on terror that had massive cost, financial, life, um, huge civilian casualties across the Middle East. Um, but I think about the Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2008, where 
um, terrorists from Pakistan came into uh, Mumbai, four days, killed 175 people. And other than tracking down those terrorists, the ringleader who was hung in 2012 as a result of it, India didn't attack Pakistan. Would there have ever been the ability for Israel to not have responded in the way that they have responded? No way. Um, absolutely not. I mean, I, I again, and I'm, you know, I'm a, a more liberal than many of the people on this call. I mean, the reality is, is Hamas needs to be destroyed. Okay. Think about what these people did. Okay. Not only did they come in into Israel and slaughter 1,400 people, they then took 240 hostages, babies, grandmothers, dads, moms. I mean, brutally just grabbed these people wholeheartedly and brought them into, into Gaza. And God knows how many of those people. I'm going to go see the hostage families after I leave here. And, and, and so the brutality of what they did and the threat in which they pose, and the idea that they don't give a crap about any humanity, meaning forget the Israelis for a minute. They don't care about the Palestinians either. The Palestinian people need to be rid of these people as well, right? And ultimately, Israel now, beyond the, the sheer number and the magnitude and the shock, if Israel is going to live in a peaceful neighborhood, they have to have a deterrent. And the deterrent is going to be twofold. One is destroying Hamas um, as quickly as humanly possible. Now, you're not going to destroy it uh, completely because it's in theology. Mm -hmm. So you can destroy the infrastructure, you can get the leaders, you can blow up the tunnels. But don't kid yourself. Like, ISIS took years and years and years, and this will be a fight that Israel will have to do for years and years and years. But yes, they have no choice because if you are Israel's enemy and you're in your Hezbollah in Lebanon, or ultimately in Iran, or you're the Houthis, and you look around, well, maybe this big, strong Israel, which we all thought was so strong, maybe they aren't so strong. No, no. The reality is, is Israel has to do four things at the same time here. One, they must, must dismantle and destroy Hamas. I, again, as liberal as I am, they have no choice. They have to do it for their own security. 225,000 Israelis are now been displaced from the north and south and living in hotels because they can't live in the north or the south. So okay. one, they got to get rid of Hamas. Number two, they got to do everything in their power to get these hostages out. I mean, there are three, 36 different countries of people that they have taken. I mean, who takes a six-month-old baby? I mean, credit, what nonsense is this? What what barbarism is what who could do something like this? So we they have to basically uh to do that at the same time. They have to try to free these hostages, and that runs complete contrary to the first, which is destroying Hamas. Right. The third thing is they got to keep Hezbollah out. Now, one reason they've been able to keep Hezbollah out, in my humble view, is the fact that Biden has said, "Guys, don't screw with us." They, they sent two very large ships in the Mediterranean with all the all the military equipment that, that those come with. Um, they basically sent a very strong message to Iran. Do not do this, or we will, you're going to see uh, the force of the United States, and we've got Israel's back. And fourth, which is very important, and we have to keep in mind, we, Israel has to do everything they can possibly do to, to save innocent Palestinians' lives, okay? And this is a war. But the reality is, is Israel needs to work as hard as they can, which is very difficult to do, to prevent innocent Palestinians' lives from being lost. And by the way, given the fact that Hamas doesn't give a crap, and given that they're using these Palestinian people as human shields, as proven by what's going on in the hospitals, what's going on with them telling uh, innocent uh, Palestinians not to leave the north, stopping them from leaving and either killing them or forcing them to stay in their apartments, they know those apartments are going to be bombed. That this is how they think. But we, but Israel needs to do the things they can do to basically not only get the humanitarian um, equipment in from the Rafah Gate from from Egypt into the southern Gaza. Would do everything to pre to preserve uh, his life. Who wants to see innocent people killed? Uh, I certainly don't. There's no one, no there's no human being in the world who wants that. But the problem is, with doing all four of those things at the same time, is very difficult because they're all uh, contrary to each other. So um, ultimately, what Israel is going, Israel will never be the same. Make no mistake. You know, people when I was in Israel, we always talked about the Yom Kippur War. We talked about the War of Independence. Uh, this is the war of October 7th. It will forever change the state of Israel uh, until 
we get a clear sense of security. Um, Israel needs to do the things they need to do to secure uh, the homeland. As it relates to the calculus, Tom, as it relates to civilian casualties, um, I think right now you accurately stated the numbers it relates to the number of people who died on um, October 7th. There are ongoing Israeli casualties of people who are fighting. Um, there's ongoing shelling coming both from the north as well as from uh, Gaza today. So it's not as if this is a one-sided conflict, but right now the number is up to, I think, about 11,000 um, deaths in Palestine. Um, the As I sit there and say, okay, at, if Netanyahu is sitting there saying there is some acceptable amount of collateral damage or not, what how 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 should we think about both the end game as it relates to does the world community does the united states because obviously president biden is getting a lot of pressure right now as it relates to the humanitarian casualties that are coming that there needs to be some line as it relates to this has to be a ceasefire at some line in our prosecution persecution of post 9 11 we went into the Middle East and my numbers from the Wilson Center at Brown University are that 420,000 civilians died, over 900,000 people total, and that we put 19 years and $7 trillion of investment into prosecuting that war. You look at that, the United States doesn't really hold up moral high ground as it relates to going after that and what the collateral damage is. How should we think about what is what you think would be acceptable as it relates to the collateral damage that's going to happen here to doing exactly what is such a stated objective, which is ridding the face of this earth of Hamas. Um, this could end tomorrow. It's quite simple. Hamas just basically gives back the 240 hostages, hopefully most of them are alive, and they basically get out of the tunnels and get on a boat and go to Qatar and go over the gun. And this is, ends tomorrow. The ceasefire starts, just give up the hostages. And, and basically walk out the tunnels. They're not going to do that. Okay? They're not going to do that. So ultimately, the, the cards are in actually Hamas's hands, right? They, they need to make a decision, you know, what they're going to do. Because Israel will do what it needs to do to, to basically rid Gaza of Hamas and the threat that Hamas poses to the state of Israel. That said, as I said earlier, Israel needs to do as much as humanly possible to prevent the loss of innocent lives. Okay. And you know, one life's too many. I mean, you can't you can't be a human being and look at these pictures, what's going on in southern Gaza or what's going on in the hospital, and have any sense of like torment. It's terrible. It's it, but I just re, I again as, as much as it hurts me, I gotta remind you, how did we get here? What we got here was basically Hamas's whole objective is just to create exactly what's happening here. Right. Okay. And that this is all in their control, meaning in their control of, of stopping this, but they don't want to. But so could, so could a boss so, could, could, a boss, boss, could a boss step in in the sense that if if we know that Hamas cannot stay in power. And that nothing will end until Hamas is completely out of power. Is there an opportunity here for the Palestinian Authority to step in to say, game's over? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, the, the current prime minister and now basically uh, um, kind of poo-pooed that idea on Sunday when he was doing his uh, TV show, which I totally reject. I think and we don't know yet what the outcome is. And certainly, in my view, Israel can't react by Gaza. That's just... That's just inherently going to not only create more conflict for the Israelis around the region. It's just it's not workable. Now they can, in the short term, create a security corridor, put some distance between uh, Gaza and southern um, uh, southern Israel to create a corridor around which this kind of activity won't be able to happen again. Uh, they we can do that. And then, but long term, long term view, in my view, is the rest of, uh, the rest of the Middle East. You know, Saudi. Kuwait, Qatar, Emiratis, Britain, they all need to be part of the solution, right? Jordanians, Egyptians, right? They need to be part of the solution. So it can't be just Israel dictating this is what's going to happen, or a boss who's not particularly well liked in many parts of the Middle East, to, to be clear, for him to just walk into the knock on the door of the of, of the Hamas parliament saying, I'm here, that's not going to work. Okay. 
but it's got to be done in a thoughtful, as like they say, in Israel, slowly, slowly. First things first, they got to rid, they got to get rid of the infrastructure of Hamas, get the leadership, basically for all practical uh, purposes, destroy Hamas. And then second, they have to create a security corridor between Gaza and Israel to get people feeling a sense of comfort, like they can live back their normal lives. But then third, they have to figure out what they're going to do in Gaza to, to basically run a country of of two million people, right. you know, it's you know, and and again, you know, it's 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 a it was a functioning it's a functioning you know uh, state. I mean, Gaza has got you know has had a lot of uh, qualities. Most importantly, have the quality of the people that exist there, minus Hamas. So ultimately, that's going to have to be part of it. I don't know. I'm not smart enough yet. Um, I know for one for sure this our administration or the administration by administration will be very clear that that cannot, the answer is not having the Israelis. Basically, uh, you know, go in and basically run Gaza. That is a recipe for disaster, and I don't think we will stand by and think that that's a good idea. But again, I think they have to do first things first, and this is getting rid of Hamas and getting these, um, uh, getting these uh, hostages back. Does Gaza, just on kind of more technical things, does Gaza have its own? Is it on the shekel, or does it have its own currency? Does it have its own electricity grid? Does it have its own? It has, all, it has stuff? all of that. It has all of that. It has. It's all, but, but, yeah, but, but, but basically, basically, it's run it has both different currencies. They got hard currencies, and they got plenty of shekels flowing in and out. And not to still wonder what happens in um, uh, in the West Bank, right? There's lots of you know dual currencies. Um, most of their um, of power. There is some generated power in Gaza. Some of it's gotten from the PA. Some of it's in Egypt. There's lots of fuel being transferred. There's, you know, it, by the way, and if you look at these pictures prior to the bombing, you know, if you look at the pictures, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like Bethesda. Uh, but, you know, uh, um, but Gaza actually had plenty, you know, it, was, it wasn't a terrible place in some places, right? I had plenty of my friends uh, or, or my former colleagues who either lived there or worked there for USCID, so I knew them quite well. Um, but again, they're, they're now going to need billions of dollars of infrastructure. Um, they're going to need a whole new, uh, a, a new government, a new, you know, ability to kind of manage this. And, and it's going to need a lot of support over the next decade and forever. You said previously, Tom, that this could end tomorrow. If you were putting some type of bracketing on how long you think this goes on for, and then followed by... What do you think as it relates to the chance that this escalates beyond the current conflict? Um, I'll do the second uh, first. I, I think it, I, it's it's unlikely, in my view, for this to dramatically escalate. Because I think the Iranians are making the bet now, the calculation is that one, you know, the, the Iranians have multiple proxies in the region, as you pointed out earlier. One, 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 uh, one of the proxies out is Hamas. For all practical purposes, Hamas will be dismantled. Now, it won't, may not be completely gone, but it will be dismantled. Israelis will be sure of that. So, they, so one of their proxies for all practical purposes now is, is, is gone, or at least severely displaced. Uh, and they're making the calculation. Their second proxy, which is Hezbollah, which is a much more powerful proxy than um, Hamas, do they want to see the same fate? And by the way, Israel and the United States will make sure that, that if especially they attack Israel in a serious way, that they I think they believe, I think Iranians believe that this could be a huge setback for now Lebanon, where Hamas is the again, same the political power in Lebanon is Hamas. So they could be you know blown back to the Stone Ages. So I think the Iranians realize one, we're serious, Americans are serious, Israel's is serious. So I I don't think on today's facts, because if they didn't get in early, that's when you get in. You get in early, come in later. Doesn't feel like the right thing to do, but who knows? We're dealing we're dealing with Iran for God's sake, so it's right. not a normal, you know, conversation. Um, um, the, the the question of how long it lasts, I don't know. I, I think that it, there's two parts of this war that people need to understand. One is the air campaign. The air campaign, and I've talked to many of my Israeli friends, is done for the sole purpose of making it safer to do the ground operation. You know, if you if you're if there are people in buildings shooting down rockets down at you, right? It's pretty hard for the Israeli military to come into Gaza City without putting many many lives at risk, which they've already lost. I don't know forty or fifty IDF soldiers already inside Gaza. So the air campaign dismantles the communications towers, the the sites onto the ground, 
So that was that has been going on. But unfortunately, when you do an air campaign in a city the size of Chicago, you're going to kill a lot of innocent people. No question about it, especially given the fact that Hamas is not letting a lot of these Palestinians leave. Okay. Now, if they all left and do what Israel told them to do, you know, obviously the loss of lives would be lessened. But so I think that the air campaign, again, I'm not a military strategist, but I think what we've been telling what, what the White House has been telling Israel, limit the air campaign. And I think the air campaign has a limited shelf life. Okay. I, I can't tell you if it's days or weeks, but it's definitely limited because that's just the way it is, because the political pressure on innocent lives we lost. The ground campaign. You know, the door to door, tunnel by tunnel, you know, move by move. This could last a long time. Now, weeks, months, I don't know, but, you know, we were fighting on the ground in ISIS for a long time after the, the massive amount of air power that was put into Afghanistan and what we attack. But again, I think ultimately, I think it's, you know, you know, they have time, they don't have indefinite time because the, the world community, you know, will demand it. You can just see how the how this kind of shifts in attitude. So, but I think the ground campaign could last certainly longer than the air campaign, and that's where we're kind of at. You talked about while you were ambassador, there were three distinct leaders of um, Israel. Netanyahu's clearly back in power. Does I thought I think back to nine eleven and the fact that President George W. Bush's popularity in the United States post nine eleven rose to I think ninety two percent, which is a all time high in the modern era for a president. Does Netanyahu, um, if you will, garner additional support because of this and that they need his heavy hand in dealing with this issue? And how long can he stay in power just from a uh, from a their parliamentary system? And so they can call the election at any time. Like, does this embolden Netanyahu or is Netanyahu still, um, if you will, compromised because this happened in the first place? Um, it's a complicated question. I don't really want to answer it because, you know, I've got my own personal views. Um, I think, listen, for, first of all, we're in a war. So any discussion about what leadership will look like during the war seems like a little premature. Okay. There is no question that going into the war, the prime minister wasn't particularly popular. As you know, as you point out, it's a parliamentary system. He got into bed with some, you know, very right wing uh, parties, uh, which drove him even more to the right. I mean, quite frankly, he's probably the, the most liberal guy in his own government, but he, this is, is who he is. Um, so ultimately, there's going to be lots of recriminations here. Okay. One thing us Jews are good at is self examination. Okay. Self reflection and self, uh, you know, self reflection and, and examination are our key, uh, are, are the key words for what we do. Um, a lot of people do it, but we are really good at it. And this, and for those of you who have not watched the Golden movie, which just came out a couple of days ago, it was really about, you know, again, they didn't know this was going to happen, but the movie was based around the commission that was set up to examine Golda Meir's involvement in the Yom Kippur War. What they did uh, after after that, what they're going to do, the examination is going to happen, is going to, is going to, you know, pale in comparison to what Israel is going to do uh, post this, okay? There's going to be a massive examination. And one would suggest, you know, when you are the leader, you're responsible for good and for bad. You know, the buck stops here. Now, he has yet to um, articulate that, even as, as as late as, you know, last this weekend when he, on the shows, wouldn't take responsibility. I think there'll be a reckoning at some point. Now, we can debate good or for bad, but that's going to happen. So ultimately, uh, I can't see a scenario personally. Against, I'm not to be clear. I'm not in the government anymore. It's so my personal views, not necessarily shared by the West. Like it's you know I'm doing a lot of you know <laughs> qualifiers here. I can't imagine the government as currently configured is the same government you know a year from now. Okay, it's hard to imagine. In fact, already as you know, uh, there's a war cabinet that's been set up with opposition leaders who joined the war cabinet led by my friend Benny Gantz, who ran against, or, you know, was part of the team, was running against BB. So he joined the government. There's seven or eight people in this war cabinet, and he's part of that. So they've already assembled, you know, some new faces. But I, I would be hard-pressed to believe um, that this government looks like it does today, a year from now. It may be even less than 
four months from now. But who knows? As you point out, there's a system. It's not in our normal system. It's a parliamentary system. So you can have votes of no confidence. Things can happen. We create all sorts of cascading events. But there's going to be a lot of self-reflection here, a lot of conversation of how we got here. And, you know, and again, that's why you're a leader. I'd be remiss if while I had you, I didn't ask you about your views on the U.S. economy, given your role as vice chairman of Morgan Stanley. I remember distinctly, Tom, it was just about two years ago right now where you and I were together and you turned to me and you said something along the lines of, hey, you know, uh, I hope you're ready for this downturn because, you know, things can't keep running this hot. Asset values can't stay up as where they were. And sure enough, two years later, you were spot on in saying to me, you know, get ready for um, some pain over the next uh, year or two. Um, That's when I told you your stock was hitting 300. Yeah, I know. I, I, re- I appreciate that. Yeah. I unfortunately went the other way. Yeah, it's it's close. It has, you know, it'll be back there. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but I, I guess my, my my question to you would be, First of all, fair to say that Jerome Powell pulled it off? Listen, first of all, no, no, no. Okay. I think there's no question um, that there's a view that inflation is slowing down. That's a fact. Okay. And, you know, how dramatic it is, we'll see what happens over the holiday season. But all the indicators would suggest today. It feels a l- little bit like a soft landing, okay? However, the people on this call know better than anyone, rates at this high are going to create a lot of breakage. And I'm sure there's plenty of people on this call who are feeling that every day, okay? I don't think it's sustainable for a y- another year or year and a half at this rate, given the, the impact it has on the real estate market, on home ownership, on the base economy that is gonna be affected because you know, there's this balance act between cooling and getting down to 3% inflation and not tipping us over into uh, a recession. And, and the people on this call know this better than I than I do, that your industry in particular is a bellwether for the economy mm-hmm. on all sorts of, from offices to multifamily to individual homes. I mean, it's this is the bellwether. And there's no question, um, it is very complicated as all these companies are trying to refinance and they can't. Okay. And, and that will have dramatic impact. So I think listen, on today's today, you know, put the stock market aside because you know, I always tell me it's not necessarily the barometer because you tell me you never look at your stock price, which is what makes me feel comfortable. But the reality of this is, I think, um, I think today on today's facts, Powell is, has done a relatively good job. There are other people who think that we are still going to go into recession, that the rates are way too high, that we will create a catastrophic event, especially given the fact that all this debt is beginning to roll off and people can't refinance and people are handing over the keys and all the things you and I talk about. But, you know, again, I think the good news about this stuff, you know, it, it'll it come in real life. I mean, this is not some sort of a- academic exercise. Either, it's, either we're going to go into recession or we're not. Either the economy is going to slow down, meaning that 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 inflation is going to slow down, or it's not. Either unemployment is going to stick at this number, or it's going to spike dramatically. So we'll be sitting here, and which, by the way, will have huge impact on the election, right? Because as you know, people still vote their checkbook; they still vote their their security, their financial security, as much as they care about their their regular security, but their economic security is front and center in people's minds. The fiscal deficit obviously has a big play on rates in your first, well, no, not your first uh, president that you worked under because you worked under previous presidents. But in the Obama administration, we ran about a 2.8% GDP fiscal deficit. In the Trump administration, that increased to 5.6%. COVID took it up to 13. We have it now down to eight. We can't afford an 8% fiscal deficit. Any confidence that regardless of who the president of the United States is in elected a year from now, that we can get our fiscal, given what's going on in Capitol Hill, you were just there meeting with Democratic senators. Can we get our fiscal house in order? Yeah, I mean, listen, I will get in a whole political conversation here because we can do that in your next, next time. Yeah, you're that's great. I'll have uh, but, the rea- but the reality is a couple of things can happen. As you know, the, I, if we had to do it over again, I don't think, yes, sir, some people think we overstimulate the economy. You know, for those of you who are on the phone here and, and we're, you know more about America than most of us who are in Washington, right? I think the decisions that the Trump administration made and then doubled down by the Biden administration, both on 
on the on the COVID recovery acts, plus the investments in infrastructure, things that we've done will play long term benefits. But you are one hundred percent right. You can't run this hot deficits as long. Now, part of this wall is the economy begins to improve, the real economy begins to improve, and and obviously that will also help on the revenue side. But they're going to have to address some of this stuff, and and we have complete gridlock in Washington. I mean, are we always had good luck. You and I are. are I've spent our, you know, I've known each other for, you know, 35 years. We've been involved in politics, obviously. I even served on Willie's board before it was a public company. I, I appreciate you taking, taking, you know, yeah. putting that out there. Yeah, I didn't exactly. put that in your bio. My early, in my early gonna... career, it was a private company yeah. at the time, yeah. a little smaller than it is today. <laughs> but I, but I, but I, but you know, I've had these conversations many, many, many times. And, you know, ultimately, the, the real economy is going to be the, the, what's going to drive the, these elections. Um, you guys understand that real economy better than most. So there is no question that we cannot run a the deficit is hot. Now the question is with the dysfunctional Congress, you know, can you address these things that need to be addressed to lower um, low deficit? And that's anyone's guess. Um, you came back from Israel to go back into the private sector. You have delayed going back into the private sector to focus on this exceedingly important issue for those of us who are both very, very concerned about it, sympathetic to it, have friends who have been directly impacted by it. I would just say thank you so much for all you are doing. Um, I and many others are looking forward to seeing what you do next. And I am deeply thankful of you taking an hour to spend time with me and inform us so deeply on these issues that are so important to our world. Thanks, Lord. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great day, and we'll be back next week. Take care.